Oh, hello. Today we are talking about my 10 best nonfiction reads for 2020. And this was an interesting year for nonfiction reading for me. I usually read more nonfiction than I actually think I will end up having read in 2020. And some of that is because in recent years, I've moved a lot of my nonfiction reading to audio. And with the quarantine, I just, it took me really until like late summer, early fall to kind of figure out a groove to incorporate audio reading back into my life because a lot of times that had been something that I would listen to, you know, when I was shopping or uh, kind of in sort of more mindless tasks at work or in the car during commuting and, you know, on a walk or whatever. Like I, I had these kind of places where audio listening would fit in my kind of daily life. And a lot of that was nonfiction audio reading. So it did take me a while to kind of get my groove back with nonfiction this year, but I definitely had some absolutely fantastic reads in nonfiction. I tend to read a lot of historical nonfiction, sort of like sociological nonfiction, current events, memoir I'm into. I mean, actually, I, I'm saying this like, <laughs> I have like specific nonfiction things I read. I read a lot of different genres of nonfiction. I really enjoy it. But yeah, anyway, so I feel like towards the end of the year, I was kind of getting back in my groove and I've been rediscovering a love of reading nonfiction kind of physically and not just in audio. So anyway, with all that being said, uh, I do have some very exciting books to talk to you guys about, so let's dive in. Number 10 is Cast from Isabel Wilkerson, and this was such a big book this year. It was an Oprah's book club pick, I'm pretty sure, and basically just like this was a very hyped new release. Isabel Wilkerson previously wrote The Warmth of Other Suns, which I have not read, but after having read this, I will absolutely make it a priority to go back and read that particular book, which was basically about the um, kind of great migration of Black Americans out out of the South into sort of Sun Belt and uh, other parts of the US. So I will definitely go back and read that. Cast is her sort of his argument from history about recontextualizing understandings of racial hierarchy in the US in terms of a caste system. And she's making uh, a lot of parallels to India and its caste system, but she's also making parallels to the Third Reich uh, in very interesting and I think thought provoking ways. I think that her use of this word to describe racial hierarchy is a really helpful and sort of has a lot of descriptive power to it. I think it's a really helpful layer to the conversation that really has been happening a lot in the last few years, but certainly in 2020, adding a really helpful kind of language to what, what we're trying to describe in things like BLM, etc. Of It's not just race, it's that there's also social class distinctions that are layered on top of that. I will say that in another book we're going to talk about that is much older than cast is, uh, that language was previously used by other authors. So I don't think she's a inventor of this term. Talk about the American uh, racial situation, but I do think it's really, um, she just has a lot of really interesting and powerful examples that she used to sort of make her point. I think particularly, I, I was aware that the Third Reich had drawn on Jim Crow laws from the South and some of their legal structuring of their racial discrimination and ultimate genocide of Jewish people in Germany, but uh, I hadn't seen it sort of laid out so clearly. So I thought that was very interesting. All in all, this is a book that has a lot of really interesting things happening in it. I do wish that it had been a little more focusedly argued. I think that I just wish it had come together a little stronger as an actual argument and I would have given it even more because there's a lot of interesting stuff here. It's just, I think it needed to be structured or shaped a little differently. I don't know. But anyway, all that to say, it's still in my top 10. I still really enjoyed it and I definitely still think it is very well worth people's time uh, in picking up. So that is my number 10. Number nine is What's Your Pronoun from Dennis? Baron, and this is a social history and linguistic history that I just absolutely had such a fun time geeking out with. Basically, so many people, now there's kind of two layers of people who get their, you know, knickers in a twist around this. People get very upset about the singular use of they, and this is basically what he spends a lot of this book <laughs> deconstructing, and there's two different people who are, are against this. There is a group of sort of, let's call them like grammar patrol people who are out there saying that it is not grammatically correct and that is why they get very frothed up about it. And then there are people who do not like sort of 
of the social connotations in terms of inclusivity of non-binary and trans identities. So there's sort of two groups who get really frothed up about the use of singular they. And what Dennis Barron does is basically go back through the history of the English language and sort of talks about how it has been a very long-standing conversation and discussion among uh, linguists of English that we do not have a gender-neutral singular pronoun and all of the different sort of band-aids and sort of patches that different people have proposed to sort of fill this gap that users of the language find themselves needing it. Like, the thing that drives me crazy about people who are so angry about singular they, they is that they gets used in a singular way all the time when you don't know the pronoun of someone. If you don't know someone's gender, like, that is the default rather than it. English users tend to use they in a singular way when a gender is unknown. So it is something that is used, uh, practi like, pragmatically, this is something that is grammatically understood and, and honestly correct in common usage. And he's basically making an argument that it has always been so and that you can find uses of singular they in Shakespeare and Jane Austen. And he also talks about some of the uh, Old English origins of different pronouns and how actually a difference between he and she was a later addition to English. It used to all be kind of gender neutered. So anyway, it was a really, I love linguistic histories in general. I also read a really good nonfiction book um, this year called Because Internet, which was about online language use. So I really like this in general. And then combining it with sort of the social history and him talking about how a singular they also has been politicized over not just the last, like say 50 years, but for a very long time, it's been a big thing. So anyway, it was just a really interesting social history that I recommend uh, if you are a fellow language nerd. Number eight is Legendary Children by Tom Fitzgerald and Lorenzo Marquez. And this was such a fun kind of, I guess another social history. All of these uh, first three are kind of different forms of social history. Uh, a social and sort of cultural, pop cultural history of RuPaul's Drag Race. And talking about how it represents uh, all of these different forces that have been fulminating in queer culture for the last hundred years. And I just really, I absolutely adore RuPaul's Drag Race. I have been watching since season one, back when they had the Vaseline filter on Rue. I've been watching for a long time. I absolutely love so much of the pop culture that has come out of RuPaul's Drag Race. And seeing that correlated to different parts of queer culture and history was just really fun. I think that the book is at its best when it's making direct parallels of moments on the show to um, things that have been a part of uh, queer, especially like nightlife culture. I think when there's like one-to-one -one comparisons, that's when the book is at its strongest. There's this great uh, chapter about Latrice as a lip syncer and kind of how that ties into the history and um, kind of why queens have been lip syncing for so long. But anyway, I just, I thought that this was really a fun, if you are into the show or just like this kind of pop cultural history, I think this is a really great uh, example of it. And I love that it used something that's like very culturally relevant in current pop culture to talk about history that people might not know about, or in, I guess her story, really. Uh, so anyway, I just thought this book was so fun and great for lovers of the show and also just lovers of recent social history. Number seven is what I'm going to call philosophy, some philosoph philosophical nonfiction, uh, which is How to Do Nothing, Resisting the Attention Economy by Jenny O'Dell. I really enjoy this book, and I have to say I very much appreciate, I think it's very appropriate for the year of our Lord 2020 with quarantine. Uh, so topically, I think this is appropriate. But also, I just really appreciated that this helped me rediscover something about myself as a nonfiction reader, which is that I very much enjoy ending my day by reading something that's philosophical or theoretical or just sort of something that makes me really think deeply. Like, that is a really calming way to end my day. And I started that practice with this book uh, back in the spring. I kind of forgot about it, to be totally honest, because of life and the craziness. When, when nonfiction November rolled around, I was like, oh, I really do want to finish that. And so in November, I kind of picked this back up as a daily practice. And by doing that, it has gotten me back in the habit of reading nonfiction before I go to bed at night. And I'm really enjoying that. It's just, it is a very peaceful ending to my day. And I just think that this was a really lovely piece of philosophy examining basically a lot of what she calls the margin for refusal in, in our culture and how because of uh, different kind of declining institutions, our margin of refusal 
refusal is getting smaller and smaller. We have our attention constantly demanded from us in uh, our work environments, but then we also are consumers of this constant attention grabbing stuff in our off time and how just with the internet, et cetera, that has just become a really difficult cycle to break. I think she has some really just interesting insights. To me, my favorite parts of this, like I said, were sort of the um, ideas about like the impossibility of retreat, uh, the anatomy of a refusal, some of that stuff I thought was particularly really wonderful. But she also talks, I think, a lot about sort of uh, the power of localization. Uh, I think that's a lot of kind of what she's arguing for in this. And yeah, anyway, this is just a very reflective, meditative, thought provoking book. And if you are somebody who's interested in philosophy and looking for sort of a place to start, I think that this would be a great example of sort of a, a good, very relatable place to start with philosophy and how it can apply in your daily life. Then number six, I believe, yeah, is I guess my favorite memoir of the year. And, and that is something that may shock and discredit you by Daniel M. Lavery. At the time of printing, his name was Daniel Mallory Ortberg, but he has since gotten married and changed his name. Um, I absolutely love this author from their time at the Toast, his time on Dear Prudence right now. It's one of my favorite podcasts to listen to. So I really enjoy his wit, humor, and just wisdom. But this is just a really moving memoir, but that it's a memoir that's almost a theology of gender because it is so steeped in biblical imagery and metaphor to talk about his transition, his journey of being a transgender man who came up in an evangelical context that was very relatable and something I very much recognize. So I think I really related to a lot of his sort of struggles in terms of gender identity in the context of evangelicalism, uh, not because I I am transgendered, but because I was a woman who did not fall into the conventional roles or sort of attributes that were expected of evangelical women. And that caused a lot of like friction and tension within me. And I just really appreciated the way that he would put language to a lot of that. There's just some beautiful, like the writing in here, I think is very beautiful at a lot of its points. And I'm trying to find this one passage that just really stuck with me. And I've thought about it several times throughout the year. And this, it's basically taking this language and metaphor that's often used in the Bible of sort of um, agricultural imagery. And uh, he says, as my friend Julian puts it, only half winkingly, God blessed me by making me transsexual for the same reason God made wheat, but not bread, fruit, but not wine, so that humanity might share in the act of creation. And I just think that he has so many great theological and philosophical insights into gender. Uh, and it was just conveyed in ways that was very just tangible and relatable to me from my background. So I just really enjoyed this memoir. And people who have read this from my recommendation, I've gotten really uh, good feedback of like, oh God, I really enjoyed that. So anyway, I just think that this is a great example of a different kind of memoir, but uh, one that I very, very much enjoyed and, and just thought was, it had a lot of humor in it. Oh, it was just great. Definitely my favorite memoir of the year. Number five is The End of Policing by Alex Vitali. And I got this as a free ebook uh, right in the middle of the height of the BLM protests uh, when there was a lot of discourse about policing policing and, and just kind of what are we going to, as, as Americans anyway, what are we going to do about this? Because we just seem to be in this cycle that's very difficult to break. And I think Alex Vitali has a really compelling argument of why policing as it is currently understood in the US and sort of all the connotations of it should not continue to exist the way that it currently does. I think what he is really talking about is what just the deterioration of the overall social services in the US to the point where if you have any kind of emergency, really the only people you can call are the, the police, an ambulance, or the the fire department. And there are so many circumstances where the person that you have to call for this emergency is a police officer and a police officer has been trained to respond to situations with violence. Now, I know that police don't, many police anyway, do not want to go into a situation and have to use force, but that is their primary training. And if it's it, basically what he's making the argument is if, if you have a hammer, every problem looks like a nail. And so he's going through just all of these different ways where a group that is trained to use force is not the appropriate remedy for a social situation, a social ill where we need some kind of intervention, but it, it really probably shouldn't be somebody who is trained to use force. And I just think that he, you know, I'm sure 
sure, well, I'm sure because of just how divisive this topic is in our country, that not everybody would agree with his findings. But I think he is very clearly articulating a problem. And I was really just compelled and challenged by what this book had to say. You know, I think that there's, I just have so many thoughts about this topic, which we don't have time to go into right now. One of my main kind of critiques or something I wish that he could unpack more in this book is how do you uncouple policing as we know it without uncouple, like without deconstructing our gun laws as they currently exist. That that was a piece of it that I think I would have liked to see him wrestle with a little bit more. But overall, I just thought that this was a really, at least to me, a very good primer and something that really made me think about the topic in a new way. And that's something that's always really exciting to me in some sort of sociological nonfiction is when I, I come away from it having a new perspective on a topic that I thought that I had thought about a lot before. So I just found this challenging in a really wonderful way and just really, really enjoyed it. So I would definitely recommend it. And yeah, very one of the most thought provoking things I read this year. Number four is Nothing is Wrong and Here is Why by Alexandra Petri. This is a collection of satirical essays that is so funny, but so dark. And really this is chronicling uh, sort of the ups and downs of the Trump era. She has a regular column in the Washington Post. So I had read some of these before, but um, there are just some real gems in here. Things that it's like gallows humor, things that will just make you laugh and then feel bad that you laughed about them. <laughs> but uh, it reminds you of just like how much we've been through in the last four years and just some of the really things that it's like you can't, it's you really, it's hard to satirize them because they are so bomb on their face. I mean, like the Four Seasons landscaping thing, that's an SNL skit, but it really happened. And like, this is a book that will just remind you of all the things like that, that you're like, oh God, yeah, I forgot about that. Wow. So anyway, this is very funny, very, I just love her her writing, her voice, her wit, her insight, um, just all of it. I think she also has a really strong, I think, moral vision in this book that is communicated satirically, but it really shines through in a way that I think is, is really wonderful. So anyway, this book <laughs> is dark, but funny. And if you're into that vibe, you will like this book. Number three is The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander. And I just feel like, like, well, I kind of feel about this way about my top three books in general. It's hard for me to say much about this book that hasn't already been said. Uh, it is such a sort of seminal text in this kind of area of nonfiction, which is thinking about the history of race in the US and sort of how we have gotten to the place that we are currently at. So maybe like the history of the last 60 to 80 years. Uh, I've seen this book referenced so many times and I kind of was expecting it not to really live up to the hype just just for me in the sense of like oh like this isn't going to be anything fresh or interesting because I've just seen its argument repeated so many times in so many different books and I was so happy to find that that wasn't the case that this book really stands on its own as a piece of nonfiction like the writing and argumentation itself is so wonderfully done so it's not even just the kind of content of it that's great it's the delivery of it and just the art of how she puts the argument together. I think it's just really wonderful and, and just exciting for me to read. I also think her kind of conclusion feels very prophetic in terms of sort of where we've come since she wrote that and kind of where we're at. Yeah, and I'll say the same thing about the next book we're going to talk about. But just overall, this is a masterpiece. People know it what am I really going to add to that conversation? <laughs> and then similarly, number two, <laughs> The Great Influenza by John M. Barry. Uh, this was obviously a very timely and appropriate pick for this year uh, because of what we have all been going through with the pandemic. And, you know, subtitle here is the story of the deadliest pandemic in history, uh, which was during World War II in 1918. And really just, I think what, what made me love this just like on an enjoyment level, and I should say this is my best of list. And when I say best of, I mean things I enjoyed the most in 2020. 20. So why this was something I really enjoyed was it included, well, it has that sort of just like, oh my gosh, can we ever learn from our mistakes? Or can we ever learn from history? Like that is a, a feeling of sort of history rhyming in a way that is just enjoyable, but also, I guess, despair making in some cases. But I enjoy that piece of it. And then I also am somebody who really enjoys the history of science. And I would say the first third of this is really a history of how medicine, like medical practice developed in the US. And I just found that to be fascinating and really uh, engaging to me. Likewise, this has a, a conclusion or like a, a coda to it of like, hey, we're not really ready for the next pandemic. And this was written, I believe, in the 90s. And it's like, oh, John, oh, how right you are. <laughs> So um, anyway, this has been very popular this year. And I definitely, for me, found it uh, to be a really great piece of historical nonfiction, prescient and relevant 
all in one. And then finally, we get to what is objectively in terms of its quality, the best book I read this year, period, in any genre. Not sure as, as of filming this, if it will be my actual top pick for 2020, but this is a classic nonfiction. It was written in the 30s by W.E.B. Du Bois and am absolutely in love with this book. S stunned by it, angry that I was not made to read it during my education at some point, and just all around, I just love, I love everything about this book. I love the writing. I love the argumentation. I love the sort of authorial posture of it. I love the dynamic of being a white woman reading the work of a black man in the 30s, interpreting the primary sources of white men in the 1860s and 70s, talking about black enslaved people. Like that dynamic, I just found to be so, so engaging. This is both a primary source and historiography, so I enjoyed it on both of those levels. I enjoyed just, this book is so good. <laughs> Love this book so much. I am so mad that it took me this long to get to it. I am in the middle of my second read of it. And this book, this book, it's just so good. I can't stop gushing about it. I hope I can persuade people to pick it up because I just loved it. So yes, that was all of my best nonfiction books of 2020. I had, like I said, kind of a, a little bit of a rocky start or sort of a rocky journey with nonfiction this year, but I'm ending it on a really positive, like I'm, I've been in the mood for nonfiction the last couple of weeks, and uh, I'm just really in a place of reminding myself of how much I enjoy it. I love, I'm just a curious, curious person, and I love learning about all kinds of different topics in history, current events, science, I mean, just all of it. I'm, I'm curious about humanity, and I love that nonfiction is another way for me me to sort of engage that curiosity. So anyway, let me know what you thought of any of the books I talked about or what maybe your favorite nonfiction pick for this year was. And yeah, I think that that will do it for now. So if you enjoyed this video, please like, subscribe, follow me on the social meds if you are so inclined. I have all that information listed in the description box below. And I think that that will do it. I hope you're having an absolutely lovely day today. And I will just talk to you soon. Bye.